only uh, glitch we have today. I guess you could call me an interloper at this point since I have not yet been installed as moderator, but surely by now you've learned to expect the unexpected from COVID-19. Today's meeting will in fact be a combination of what should have been last May's annual day, minus the wonderful salads and fabulous desserts, and our September opening day. I'm going to turn the meeting over to Melissa Mintz in just a second, but first there are a few housekeeping details. Wilson Kennedy is our host for this event, and you have no idea what he has done to make this meeting a reality for us. At this point, Wilson has all of you muted, and with such a large group, it's extremely important that you stay muted. Those who need to unmute for various things during the course of the meeting have already been instructed as to when that should happen. He did suggest if you're having technical issues, you might click on chat at the bottom of your screen and type in your concern. And he'll try to address that if it, at all possible. There are a lot of moving parts to today's meeting. And uh, as Wilson mentioned, we're uh, looking for a great deal of grace. We have said our prayers for smooth sailing on the sea of technology. But if you remember the letter that I sent in August, I used two oh. words, flexibility and creativity. Yes. Hey, Sally, how are you? I'm fine, but I can't get any, any um, <coughs> sound. Melissa, I've got the, the picture, meeting. but I don't have the sound. Okay, now, are you I think you passed it to me. <laughs> okay, um, I did. Still no picture. I mean, Again, no picture. welcome. Um, I want to start with a few words about Blair. Um, if we had been able to celebrate annual day in May, I would and have introduced Blair to you that. after giving my report. And she would have assumed her role as moderator. But you've already been wowed by the wonderful job she's done getting us organized and set for this year. Those of you who already know Blair from Circle 7 or as a Sunday school teacher or the Christmas pageant coordinator also know what a dynamite job she does with anything she takes on and she will continue to amaze us. As I'm with Blair last year while she served as moderator-elect, I asked why PW? And or why get involved with PW? And she laughed and said it was a little bit of a funny story. Um, she was asked to serve as the program chair almost immediately upon her retirement. Um, and she told me that she'd only ever attended a couple of PW programs, the sister story programs that took place on Sunday afternoons. She had gotten to go to those with her mother. So she decided she would ex take a leap of faith and accept the job um, because she wanted to get involved. So now she's moderator. <laughs> um, Blair's also a longtime member of Circle 7. And when I asked her what Circle 7 meant to her, she said that in the beginning, it was a way to make a big church seem smaller, but that now that it is a home. Blair's number one hobby is her four grandchildren. She also likes to knit, smock, and read. Something you may not know about her is that she broke her leg playing basketball in ninth grade and that she met John while they were both cotillion helpers. Blair will be a wonderful PW moderator as she will welcome you with her warmth and lead you with her wisdom and her organization and nurture you with her strong faith as she models how to live out Christian values in the church in our city. I'm thrilled that Blair is our PW moderator. But before I officially sign off as uh, to what my business was, it was decided that I would give the 2019-2020 annual report. I had the privilege to serve as your moderator for the past three years, and it was indeed a joy to talk, to study, to plan and play and dream, learn and serve with many women in our congregation was inspiring. 
Last summer, I chose scripture from Eugene Peterson's translation from the message. Listen to the living word from Romans 12 verses one and two that describes you to me. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embrace what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. I've watched and continue to see you do this. Take your everyday ordinary life and generously and gracefully put it into God's hands as an offering. Last year, the women of this church served on committees from PW Council to finance. You ushered, greeted, baked, took minutes, wrote reports, acted as mentors to our youth, taught Sunday school to our children, attended Bible studies, read books, and facilitated discussions, wrote letters to members, prayed, attended programs, worshiped, sang in the choir, led circle meetings, remembered birthdays, helped with funerals, opened your homes for circle meetings, volunteered for care class, and at George Mason, now Henry Marshall Elementary School, drove the Taiwo family to church and rode the bus to support our bus ministry, delivered flowers to brighten a day, and adopted families at Christmas and continued to help them during the year. Your generous and amazing hospitality were highlighted last fall when we hosted the PW Presbytery of the James Fall Gathering. And again, when we celebrated Suzanne Reel's retirement in December, honoring her at our December luncheon and with a reception for the entire church on her last Sunday. I've said this several times as your moderator. One of my favorite things is to attend each circle and see you in action. The energy ripples through the room as you laugh and study God's word and pray and discuss ways to serve our church and community. Each group has a different focus and a different number, but each group is full of love. I always walked out smiling, thrilled to have seen the Holy Spirit at work among you. Each circle has truly fixed her sight on God and is slowly changing the world from the inside out. Circles directly sponsor a variety of projects of interest throughout the year, and you gave lots of books and supplies to Henry Marsh, made the youth dinner, supported the Virginia home, Elijah House, Kairos Prison Ministry, and Camp ha Happy Land Boy and Girls Club of Richmond, Virginia. You all are also quick learners, and um, several of you pivoted quickly in April and May to Zoom meetings. We held council by Zoom then. And during these spring meetings, the Presbyterian Women Council made the unanimous decision to spend some of our savings to help the community in a time of crisis due to COVID-19. We gave $2,000 to Feed More and $1,000 to Mary Kay and Amy's Pastors Discretionary Funds. We're currently working on deciding how to share some more of our resources as we learn of needs. Thank you for allowing me to serve alongside you. I pray you continue to fix your attention on God because all of the seemingly little everyday things you do ripple out into the world and bubble up, becoming bigger things that truly make a difference. And now to conclude our 2019-2020 Presbyterian Women Business, I'd like to invite Libby Marsh to present the budget for 2020-2021. Libby? Libby, this is Wilson. If you could unmute yourself, please. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Libby Marth, and I am the chairman of the PW Finance Committee. I am pleased to report that the finances of the FPC PW are in very good shape. That is primarily thanks to all of you who generously donate to PW through your annual pledges. In addition, Nancy Hamner is an excellent treasurer. 
She keeps meticulously accurate records and has worked with Melissa to be sure your funds are well managed, accurately accounted for, and wisely and appropriately dispersed. Earlier this year, the budget for PW's current fiscal year, fiscal year July 1st, 2020, through June 30th, 2021, was approved by PW Council. A copy of this budget has been sent to each of you for review, and I hope you've had a chance to look at it. I would like to highlight a few of the items in the budget. You will notice that the primary source of income are our pledges. For the upcoming year, we projected $8,000. That's a conservative estimate, but the best guess estimate that we are comfortable with, particularly in this um, year of unknowns and Zoom meetings and all the other things that are going on. That being said, I encourage each of you to continue your annual pledge and perhaps consider an increase. Again, it is our only source of funding for PW expenses and especially for our PW benevolence. Other sources of income are the income from the luncheons and the study books, but those income sources are used to directly pay for the expense associated with them. We budgeted last spring for a full and regular year of luncheons, but obviously that is not going to happen. So the decline in luncheon income will be offset by the expense that will not be incurred for the cost of the luncheons. The other expenses are divided primarily into two categories. We have operating and administrative expenses and our benevolence. The administrative expenses include the program expenses, the receptions, yearbook, etc. The largest of these expenses include the cost of luncheons and the yearbook. As I just mentioned, the luncheon expense will be less than budgeted because unfortunately we will be having fewer, if any, luncheons this year. As Blair Tuning mentioned in a recent letter to PW, changes are being made to the yearbook distributions and the information update. These changes will help to contain the rising cost of the printing of the yearbook each year. Your leadership of your PW Council is always looking for ways to control expenses and to be good stewards of your money. Our benevolences are gifts and donations made through the Presbytery of the James and other donations made for gifts and appeals that in the past have been important and special to the FPCPW. These change from time to time as the focus of our organization changes. And both Melissa and Blair have alluded to extra benevolent donations that have been made and are being considered to be made. As is painfully obvious to all of us, there will continue to be changes in income and expenses of PW this year as we adapt to our ability to meet in person, provide programs, etc. We will continue to be flexible in our effort to be fiscally responsible with the PW funds entrusted to us. Are there any questions about the PW budget for the upcoming year? If you have any, as you look back over the budget, please feel free to contact me or Blair if you should have any questions. So if there are no questions, Melissa or Blair, whoever I throw this back to, I move that the PW budget for July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021, as presented, be approved. Well, listen, Blair, this is Wilson. Um, I am wondering that in the spirit of in technology, if there are no questions, um, that the silence of the room be counted as acclamation and your budget can be approved. That sounds good to me. I agree. I second. Then I believe that our budget is adopted and we can go forward. Um, one of my favorite things is to be able to thank and shine the spotlight on women who are amazing and worthy of praise and respect. 
women who I strive to emulate. Today, we get to do this by participating in a Presbyterian women tradition that dates back to 1912. The Presbyterian Women Honorary Life Membership is conferred upon honorees in recognition of faithful service to our church. Recipients of this honor have included moderators, Sunday school teachers, choir members, circle members, pastors, and leaders in every aspect of our church life. This year, Missy Ryan served as chair of the Presbyterian Women Nominating Committee. The committee members were Mona Mullins, Kathy Watson, and myself. We received lots of wonderful nominations, and we thank you for your participation. We are thrilled to honor two amazing women for 2020. These two women were obvious choices, and if you have the pleasure of knowing them, we think you will agree. We wish that we could be in the sanctuary today with their families hiding in the balcony, but Zoom is our way to connect this year. You should know that Mary Kay and Missy and me got to surprise them to add a personal touch. So they know who they are. Um, over the last few weeks, we arrived with flowers and smiles behind our masks and waves that wafted through the wind to wrap them in hugs. We got to tell them how beautiful and amazing that Presbyterian women think they are. It was truly a highlight during our months apart to see and celebrate with each one of them. Our first nominee or honoree, our first honoree is a dedicated, wonderful Circle Four member. Loyal and faithful, she's always in attendance and invites others to attend. Devoted and welcoming and supportive, supportive of the FPC community as an elder, a member of the Resurrection Choir and homebound communion server. She is a true disciple and has participated in many classes and Bible studies where she shared her deep faith and love of family. She can be found almost every Sunday sharing her love in the balcony. She is a tower of strength and so deserving of this recognition. She is Nancy Hayes Gottwald. Our second honoree is a former moderator a former deacon and a George Mason volunteer. She served homebound communion as a Stephen minister and a member of the care and concern ministry team. She too is a disciple and enjoys participating in class to grow her strong faith. She has been a circle four leader three times. Her devotion to FPC and her conscientiousness make her deserving of this honor. She is Eleanor Powell Darden. Nancy and Eleanor, you are both gems. I hope that all of you listening today will reach out to both of these outstanding, amazing ladies by text or phone, email or snail mail, and wish them congratulations and gratitude for all that they have done and continue doing. Now, please join me in a standing ovation that they can see, if not here, as we celebrate them you are indeed our stars. And I believe we're ready to move on to the uh, installation of the uh, new office for this year. All right, I think that's me. I'm sorry, Wilson, I thought you had something in between there. Well, it's wonderful to be 
with you all today. It's great to see so many faces and um, to be able to gather together like this. I have such fond memories of my first annual day last year. Um, and I'm grateful uh, to Melissa and Blair for the, the perseverance and creativity they have both shown in figuring out ways to um, continue the um, meaningful fellowship and service of Presbyterian women during this challenging time. So thank you all for that. Um, I also um, wanted to just share because ask me to that um, Mary Kay is not feeling well and getting some rest. And so she was really, really sad not to be here and asked me to send her regrets and send her love to all of you. Um, it's my honor today to lead this service of installation for um, those who are um, taking on a role as officers for the coming year for Presbyterian women. So we will begin that with a call to worship based on words from prophet Joel. This prophet tells us that the spirit of God is poured out for us. Our sons and our daughters shall prophesy. Our old ones will dream dreams. Our young ones will see visions. Male and female, slave and free, all who call on the name of the Lord will witness God's saving love. Let us pray. God of infinite wisdom, we come to you today knowing we do not always see with your eyes. You promise us vistas of beauty and wholeness, yet we focus on destruction and despair. Guide us toward your perfect realm, O oh God. Illumine in us your spirit. Clarify our sense of purpose as women who lead and serve in your name. Amen. Women with a clear sense of vision are nothing new. We find them all over the Bible. In Exodus chapter 15, we encounter Miriam, the prophet, singing her victory song, tambourine in hand, and dancing with women after they escaped bondage in Egypt. Later, we meet Huldah, another prophet, who advised the priests of Josiah, communicating God's word to the king of Judah and his people. That's in 2 Kings. In the Gospels, we find Elizabeth, who was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave a prophetic greeting when she saw Mary, who was pregnant with Jesus at the time. Perhaps our most familiar woman of vision is Mary herself, who accepted that she was the mother of a holy child and offered herself as a faithful servant of God. This year, as we celebrate the centennial anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, giving women the right to vote, we also remember American women of vision. Harriet Tubman used her vision of freedom to escape slavery and rescue others through the Underground Railroad. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton used their vision of justice to organize and lead the women's equality and suffrage movements. Minnie Spotted Wolf used her vision of service to become the first Native American woman enlisted in the United States Marine Corps Women's Reserve. Eleanor Roosevelt used her vision of righteousness to help draft and secure adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Berta Caceres had a vision that the environment should be honored and protected as should the needs and traditions of her tribe in Honduras. While women from the Bible and from history give us inspiring examples of visionary lives, we can also certainly look to our own communities and honor those who lead with the light of God, as we have certainly done today in honoring Nancy and Eleanor. But I ask you to think about this afternoon, who are the women of vision in your life? How do you honor them? Or how do you apply their vision to your life and ministry? As Presbyterian women, we share God's promise of peace, hope, reconciliation, justice, and love. We're inspired by women who came before us and led with faithfulness bravery and their own dreams of what was possible. 
we look to our leaders today with hope for their own visions of service now and into the future. Now let us confirm our commitment to God and to each other by hearing again our Presbyterian women purpose. Forgiven and freed by God in Jesus Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit, we commit ourselves to nurture our faith through prayer and Bible study, to support the mission of the church worldwide, to work for justice and peace, and to build an inclusive, caring community of women that strengthens the Presbyterian Church USA and witnesses to the promise of God's kingdom. Again, let us pray. Holy God, we give thanks that you seek out leaders to guide us. We know that your purposes for this world are lived out through the work of amazing women, those who give their time to teach others, those who give their money to support mission, those who give their talents to serve in your name. As we commit and recommit ourselves to your service, help us to catch your vision for this caring community. Amen. And at this point, um, moving into the questions of installation, I'm going to invite those of you who are being installed today to unmute yourselves so that you can answer the questions. And even if it's not in perfect unison, we can hear your answers. So you can go ahead and do that. And here are our questions. Will you be faithful to the PW purpose and do your best to lead your fellow Presbyterian women with the love, compassion, and courage that we encounter in Christ Jesus? Will you? We will. We will. Will you learn from the women you are leading? being open to different and even uncomfortable points of view? And will you respond with grace when disagreements arise? Will you? We will. Will you motivate others to follow you, demonstrating the joy and enthusiasm that you receive from the Holy Spirit? Will you? We will. We will. will you draw closer uh, and I'm sorry, this question is for everyone here. So you're welcome to, to unmute yourselves for this moment and answer this question. Will you draw closer to these leaders whom God has raised up, offering them support and grace as they take on this task? Will you? You will. Oh, you'll be well. You will. Wonderful. So Blair, Beth, Susan, Dee, Mika, Linda, Van, Aaron, Cynthia, Melissa, Susan M, and Sheila, you are duly installed leaders of Presbyterian women for the First Presbyterian Church of Richmond, Virginia. As we are reminded by scripture, God calls women and equips them with bold vision, strong voices, and faithful spirits. You can rejoice knowing that your creator not only calls you but claims you and gives you everything you need to lead and to serve. We have had courageous and insightful women before us, among us now, and to lead in the future. We can go out and serve with open eyes, knowing that God will always show us the way. Amen. Amen. So at this time, I have the honor and privilege of introducing someone that I suspect does not need a lot of introduction here at First Presbyterian Church in Richmond. Um, she was with us uh, a little over a year ago at my installation, and I was thinking back to that today and remembering the charge that she delivered to the congregation where um, she charged all of us to be a little bit afraid. I don't know if you all remember that, but uh, it was a wonderful charge and, um, and it was wonderful to have her with us on that day. Um, 
And uh, Jill Duffield was somebody whose name I had heard quite a bit um, before I was called here to be your pastor, um, but was really excited to know that being here um, it meant that I would get to finally meet her in person. And um, that has indeed been wonderful. And I'm so grateful to call her both a colleague and a friend. Currently, as many of you know, Jill is serving as the editor and publisher of the Presbyterian Outlook. Um, the Outlook is an independent publication um, that has all kinds of information about the PCUSA, our uh, denomination, and other things as well. And um, I certainly hope that many of you have had the opportunity to uh, be regular readers of the Outlook. Um, it is a, uh, a wonderful publication and has really grown and, and flourished under Jill's leadership. And I am blessed weekly by Jill's amazing and insightful writing um, in both her editorials and um, her reflections on the lectionary scripture passages each week. Um, Jill earned a BA in history from the University of North Carolina in Greensboro and graduated with her Master of Divinity from Union Presbyterian Seminary here in Richmond uh, and was ordained as a minister of word and sacrament in the Presbyterian Church and has served a number of different churches in our denomination. In 2013, she earned her Doctor of Ministry from Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary um, where she now serves on the board. Um, she has, she's quite a writer as well as a preacher. She has writing in um, commentary series. She published a book last year of Lenten devotionals um, that uh, and I know would be really meaningful. Um, and uh, Again, she, she writes regularly for the Outlook, and her writing has won a number of awards, including, and I love the name of this award, the Associated Church Press James Solheim Award for Editorial Courage. And she is really courageous in her editorials, and, um, and uh, I, I have really appreciated that. Um, Jill is a wonderful preacher and has been invited to preach in lots of different settings and places um, and uh, is also has a busy personal life too, is married um, to her husband Grant and together they have three children, Joseph, Jesse, and Marissa. So I am really excited that Jill has been able to um, record her, her um, uh, her offering for us today and look forward to, to hearing her and I'm honored to introduce her to you. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you. I'm sorry we can't be together in person, but I am delighted to be with you nonetheless. I want to talk to you about navigating uncertain times with perspective, presence, power, and promise. And I want to begin our time together with a reading from Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. Hear now the word of God. And when Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him. A windstorm arose on the sea, so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And when they went and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the seas, and there was a dead calm. They were amazed, saying, what sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Friends, perspective doesn't come easily in the middle of a storm. Familiar landmarks that previously kept us on course become difficult to see. Our feelings towards those in the boat with us move from deep affection to complete annoyance and everything in between as we attempt to make it to shore and they alternately panic or participate in that goal. When we're in the middle of a storm, we grow physically tired. We are on constant alert for danger. Sleep is elusive because we are afraid our survival is at stake. 
When we're in the middle of a storm, ordinary rhythms get jettisoned and replaced with the urgent task of bailing or rowing or managing the sails. Storms do not lend themselves to introspection. In the middle of upheaval, we forget that storms are not everlasting. When we're in the middle of a storm, we can't recall that people before us have endured worse and longer threats than the storms we are being battered in by the moment. When we're in the middle of this upheaval and this chaos and this fear, we cannot imagine that there may well be some important learnings that come out of this time. When we are in the middle of a storm, we lose sight of the reality that we're not alone in navigating the boat and that we in fact have abilities and skills and wisdom that will enable us to make it to safety. When we're in the middle of a storm, we forget the profound truth that in life and in death, we belong to God and that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. The longer and more arduous the squall, the harder it becomes to keep the faith that this current upheaval is not our perpetual reality. When I read this story from Matthew in our context, I feel for the disciples. And while I may not be attempting to survive wind and waves on the high sea, 2020 is battering us all. We're in the middle of so many storms, a pandemic that has brought with it not only illness and death, but a swamping of the economy, a loss of in-person community, an upending of our day-to-day -day routines that offered some sense of security and normalcy. We're in the midst of so many storms. There's racial injustice, videoed and gone viral. There's grief and outrage marching in the streets. There's division and violence displayed across the nation. We're in the middle of an election season with rancor and disdain week after week after week. It feels as if we are in a small boat being tossed around by threatening elements. And I don't know about you, but I wanna know where is Jesus in all of this? Is he asleep? Is he on the mountain praying? Is he seated at the right hand of God, judging the quick and the dead? Well, that's all well and good, but we're about to go under right here and right now. You see, it's hard to have perspective. We're in the middle of a storm and we don't know what the outcome is going to be, when the ending will come, if we're even gonna make it to safety. So the question for us as followers of Jesus Christ, as followers of the one who has power over even the wind and the sea, the one who said, be not anxious, the one who told us, don't worry about tomorrow and my peace I leave with you and lo, I am with you always. How are we called to act in the midst of these multiple disasters, both natural and human made? Emily Towns writes in a piece called Womanist Understanding of Vocation. She writes this, God's presence is in the very fabric of our existence, imminent and transcendent, close as our breathing. God is not an option or on the supplemental reading list. God's love for us is unconditional. God makes demands, has commands. Perhaps the simplest and hardest of these is that we are called to live our lives out of the possibilities and not the shortcomings, answering yes to God's what if. Perhaps our faithful living of this day and of these tumultuous days begins with that perspective. Maybe it begins with the recognition that Jesus is not only in the boat with us, but present in the very fabric of our existence. Let's rest in that truth for just a moment. Let's rest in the truth that God is as close as our breathing. With that truth recognized and confirmed with every single breath, could we, in this time of so many storms? Could we knowing that God is in the very fabric of our existence, 
Could we who know that God is as close as our breathing, could we be the calmest ones in the boat? Could we take terms at the helm so that everybody can have some rest and relief? Could we be the ones to use our skills, whatever they are, to provide relief wherever we can? And remembering that Jesus is with us, could we call on him for help and trust that he will answer? Could we, in this tumultuous time, as the body of Christ, live our lives out of possibilities rather than shortcomings? Could we live our lives out of faith instead of fear, out of hope and not out of resignation? Could we be those people in this boat even now, especially now? Gregory the Great says that wisdom is born of wonder. Could we in this time ask together very questions about wonder? Could we ask one another, I wonder where the spirit is working in all of this? Could we ask with holy curiosity, I wonder what our call is in this community right now. Could we wonder together how God will give us good things even out of that which is intended for evil? Could we wonder together how it is we are blessed that we might be a blessing? Could we wonder where is beauty found this day? Or what is God doing right now? What new thing is God doing right now? Can we perceive it? Could we wonder together if we will see or be the face of Christ today? Could we wonder what might happen if we said yes to God's what if? Friends, right now, few of us are our best selves. Many of us, perhaps all of us, are scared and anxious. We are stretched and we are stressed. And when we are stressed, we will default to any sort of behavior that will bring a temporary relief to the pain we feel, no matter if it hurts ourselves or other people. We just want to feel a little better, even for a moment. I read the narrative of the golden calf again recently, and it seemed like a brand new story in our current context. When I read it this time, I came to understand that idolatry is so often born of fear. You see, Moses had been gone a long time. The Israelites had suffered much trauma. They were terrified of what might come next, and in their fear, they created and worshipped a false god. We do that too. Those Israelites, out of their fear, put their trust in that which could never save them. They made ultimate something that was utterly impotent. They panicked. They lost perspective and they forgot all that God had delivered them from already. They forgot all that they had survived so far. They forgot all of God's faithfulness to them up to that moment. And so they bowed down to a useless, false God. They fixed their loyalty to a tribal statue, replacing their love of their infinite creator. They acted out of shortcomings rather than possibility. And we often do the same when we are afraid. So can we, in this storm, we who follow Jesus Christ, can we seek to have a faith perspective that quells our fears? Can we have a discipleship discernment that offers us the peace that passes understanding, a holy wisdom that sees through false teachings and narcissistic narratives of survival and scarcity and reveals instead the goodness and mercy that is right now chasing us down? Can we for a moment in the midst of these storms stop? And survey the scene and remember that Jesus is with us. 
and to seek to follow and fulfill God's commandments even now, especially now. Can we love God and our neighbors? Can we love the ones in the boat with us, the ones who are barely keeping their heads above water all around us, the ones on the shore watching the dark clouds come towards them, the ones who are desperate for a lifeline, and yes, even the ones who are still sure that the storms of life do not concern them. In 2020, can we in Christ's church remember that even the wind and sea obey our Lord and keep the faith? Keep the faith that Jesus is near and will not let us go under. Can we wonder together about God's what if and then say yes to it? Can we act out of divine possibility instead of being bound by already Christ-defeated shortcomings? Friends, if we are to live that kind of countercultural, fear-facing, embodied courage, we will need some things. We will need to remember that Jesus is in the boat with us. We will need to remember that God is present in the very fabric of our existence as close as our breathing. We will need to be present to each moment and to each other. We will need to keep before us the words of the psalmist, where can I go from your spirit, Lord? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take wings on the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. If we are to act out of love and not fear, we need to remember Jesus' words, I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. We need to rely on God's power and not our own. Remembering that if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we can move mountains. Remembering that through Christ, all things are possible. Remembering that God will do abundantly more than we can ever hope or imagine. Remembering that Jesus sends us the advocate, the Holy Spirit, to teach us everything and remind us of all that Jesus said. If we are to live out of love, the perfect love that casts out fear, we need to rest in God's promises. Knowing that Jesus tells his followers, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find, knock, and the door will be open for you. We need to remember that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Spirit intercedes with us with sighs too deep for words. We need to cling to the promise that the home of God is among mortals. And God will dwell with us. And we will be God's people. And God will be with us, so close that God wipes the tears from our eyes. Friends, we are all in the same boat, navigating a storm like no other. But Jesus, the one with the power over the wind and the waves, he is in the boat with us. Will we call on him? and reveal his presence and saving power to those terrified they are about to go under. Howard Thurman writes this, the movement of the Spirit of God in the hearts of men and women often calls them to act against the spirit of their times or causes them to anticipate a spirit which is yet in the making. In a moment of dedication, they are given wisdom and courage to dare a deed that challenges and to kindle a hope that inspires. Through the lens of our faith, knowing that God is with us, trusting in God's power, confident in God's promises, 
Will we be the ones who give in to the movement of the Spirit, acting out of divine possibility, wondering about God's what if, and saying yes to it, and daring deeds that counter the spirit of fear so prevalent in our time? Will we be the ones who kindle a hope that inspires the perfect love that casts out fear and enables us not just to weather the storm, but to get to the shore where we can rejoice, give thanks, and sing together? My friends, may God grant you a holy perspective one that enables you to feel the divine presence within and around you so that you will give in to the Spirit's power and embody Christ's promises to you and to the world for such a time as this. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm awfully glad that we're recording this. I know that I will find myself going back time and time again to listen to Jill's words and the four P's in, in her title. Um, would that she were here to thank in person. But the first rule of public speaking is never to apologize. So I'm not going to do that, but I will simply say that this feels very surreal. Three years ago, I was planning to retire after almost 40 years in the classroom when the very persuasive Dorothy Kufler convinced me that I needed a project. She was certain that I could do the job of PW's second vice moderator a daunting title I later learned meant program chair. Melissa already told you about that. Now, mind you, as someone who was teaching full-time, I had attended only nine PW programs since joining First Presbyterian in 1985. Eight of those programs were sister stories, and the ninth was annual day 2002, when my mother received her Honorary Life Membership Award, presented so lovingly by Marsha Williams. What a day that was. My point is that faith and the support of many of you here today helped me leap into the deep end then, and I continue to do that now. But I have come to realize that PW has always been a part of my life. When I was growing up, my mother spoke often about the fellowship, Bible study, and projects of her circle at Tuckahoe Presbyterian Church. I learned early on how important that small group was to her. Once we moved back to Richmond and settled on First Presbyterian as our church home, I immediately went in search of a circle to fulfill me in the ways it had my mother. Enter Circle 7, a small group of working women that met in the evening once a month. Home. I had found my home. Circle 7 has seen me through some of the most difficult times in my life. Their support is never ceasing but then I'm sure each of you would attest to that very same thing about your own circle. We rejoice with one another when children marry, grandbabies are born, or a military son or daughter returns home safely. We console and sustain one another through surgeries, separations, and deaths. PW offers lifelines and Circle 7 has been that for me. Now, here we are today in truly uncharted waters. Our church staff 
and I'm sure you will agree with this, has gone to extraordinary lengths to build community and keep us feeling connected as a congregation. But now it's our turn. We put things on hold this spring, expecting the pandemic to pass so we could get back to normal. But exactly when is normal going to return? It is our task to carry on and do the very best we can given these less than ideal circumstances. Today's meeting is a perfect example. We all wish we could embrace Nancy and Eleanor, showering them with our congratulations on their well-deserved recognition. We wish we had been able to have Jill Duffield here in person, speaking from the pulpit in our beautiful sanctuary. We wish we could shake the hands of our new officers as they begin this new year. And we certainly wish we could give Melissa Mintz a standing ovation for her three-year tenure as moderator, along with the 10,000 other things she has done at FPC. I wouldn't be here were it not for Melissa. She has encouraged me, informed me, supported me, and inspired me at every turn. But we aren't meeting in person, so few of these wishes can be realized, at least not in the usual sense. But this is where we need to step up, be creative, and do it differently. Your coordinating council is already hard at work making decisions to streamline the responsibilities of circle treasurers and brainstorming how best to get the directory updates into your hands sooner rather than later. I promise you they're coming. Melissa encouraged you to reach out to Eleanor and Nance with a card, a call, or an email. See, you can let them know how much their efforts have meant to you, just not in person. Perhaps you might decide to call or email one of the new PW officers to encourage her for the year ahead. Or consider this, send program chair Julie McGrath an email about a program you find meaningful this year, or offer a suggestion for a future speaker. And please, please promise that you will reach out to me to let me know what's working and what isn't. As I said in my letter to you, this will be a year of being flexible and creative. There is one thing we can do in much the same way it has been done in past years though. I mentioned my personal gratitude for Melissa Mintz's leadership and her friendship, but PW would like to honor her service in a tangible way. Many of you may remember last February's luncheon program with speakers Jamie Wigginton and Mark Herzholzer from Art for the Journey. The invaluable, inspiring work of this organization really struck a chord with Melissa. So the council has unanimously approved a $3,000 donation be made to Art for the Journey for the important work that they do and in gratitude for her service to FPC. From the bottom of our hearts, we thank you, Melissa. Now, Melissa is just one of the moderators who has had an impact on my life. Last spring, I reached out to each of the women who fulfilled this role from the time I joined the church in 1985. What you're going to see is my thank you to them. I am excited about our future and all we can accomplish together. I look forward to my time as moderator. But for now, I invite you to take a look at our past, to remember and honor the debt we owe to each one of these amazing women. I am standing on the shoulders of the ones who came before me. 
I am stronger for the courage. I am wiser for the words. I am lifted by the longing for a fair and brighter future. I am grateful for the vision for the toiling on this earth. We are standing on the shoulders of the ones who came before us. They are saints and they are humans. They are angels, they are friends. We can see beyond the struggles and the troubles and the challenge when we know that by our efforts things will be better in the end. They lift me higher than I could ever fly, carrying my burdens away. I imagine our world if they hadn't tried. We wouldn't be here celebrating today. I am standing on the shoulders of the ones who came before me. I am honored by their passion for our liberty. I will stand a little taller, I will work a little longer, and my shoulders will be there to hold the ones who follow me. Thank you to each one of you for being a part of today's special celebration. We look forward to gathering again on October 6th when Drs. Matt Bitsko and Bryn Moore from Summit Emotional Health will guide us in productive ways to maneuver these challenging times while maintaining good mental health. You would agree, a very timely topic. With our incredible PW organization at work, this has the potential to be a truly extraordinary year. The pandemic has shown us time and again what can be accomplished when we use our talents and resources. Was I muted? Okay. Um, what Sorry, <laughs> the pandemic has shown us time and again what can be accomplished when we use our talents and resources for the good of others. Let us all remember the words of 1 Peter 4.10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace. And now as the last slide in the moderator tribute said, May God hold you in the palm of his hand until we are together again. Amen. <laughs>